in the lane, 15, 10, touchdown, Chargers! What's up, guys? Welcome into our first off-season edition of 2023 of Chargers Weekly. As always, joined by Matt Money-Smith. And Money, I haven't talked to you on this pod since Saturday. Um, a lot to cover. Uh, yeah. We'll get into Brandon Saley's presser, Tom Telesco's presser. But I'd be remiss if I didn't go back to Saturday and kind of get your thoughts as you watch that game unfold the radio booth with DJ. Well, look, you know, I think there's, there's a couple things, right? One, you know, you, I think you have to separate the success of the regular season with the – in the success of the first half with the failure of the second half. And I, and I think that's probably what, you know, the front office was kind of going through when they decided to make some of the changes they're going to make this off season, you know, for, for people that are taking shots at, at coach Staley, um, I think, you know, and kind of some of the things that we said on the radio show all week long was look, you know, you watch teams fall one by one week after week, unable to handle the pressure of what was a tight race for the back end of these wild card spots. You know, the, the Dolphins are losing. They're 8-3, and three, and now they're borderline out of the playoffs. The Patriots, you know, fumble a game away. The, the Jets were 7-3 and three and, and watched it all slip from their hands. The Raiders, you know, all of those teams fell apart when the, the Chargers were able to keep it together and, and lock up a playoff spot with two games to go. So you give, you know, everyone credit for rallying, and, and playing sure. at that level. Uh, you also give them credit for having a heck of a defensive game plan to start that playoff game. You know, they knew what Trevor Lawrence liked to do, attack the middle of the field. They knew if you got him off his spot that he'd get a little loose with the football. And, you know, Asante Samuel comes up with three interceptions, Tranquil with one. They got their hands up repeatedly to bat passes, knowing that he wanted to get the ball out quick and the pass rush wasn't going to get home. Like, you know, things are great. Um, the one thing I will say is in that first half, the offense still, you know, there were, there were plays, but there weren't, I was still a little worried about the, the, the offense. You know, you get all those turnovers and you're getting a lot field of short goals. Fields, right? A lot of short sure, I mean, you got a goal to go from the six yard line on the muff punt. Well, not a muff punt, but the punt that bounced off the dude's head, you know, and you can only get three points out of that. You know, you can't get the 18 feet that you need from an offense. And it just felt like that was starting to show up in that first half. Like, okay, offense isn't really moving the ball well. You know, Justin's got a couple really nice passes. You know, Austin's got a couple runs there early for those touchdowns. But outside of that, you could you could sort of see that the offense wasn't right. Um, you know, just jump in whenever you want because there's a million things to get to here, Chris. I, You know, and, and perhaps it was irresponsible of me, but – you know, I said it in the moment. You know, I can still remember my call. I just I, I, just almost yelled, what are they doing? You know, when they ran the third and a half yard play and the speed sweep to Bandy. I mean, that's exactly what I said on the call. I said, what are they doing? You know, you've and, and I think it goes back to something that we've talked about here. And that's just, you know, there's, there's two things there. One, players versus plays. Sometimes offensive coordinators and play callers get too caught up in plays. Like, ooh, I got something here. I'm going to get them flat-footed on this speed sweep because I see the way they're lining. This is the way to do it. Um, instead of, I've got a six foot six, 230-pound quarterback that's 9 for 9 on sneaks this season and 23 of 24 in his career. Yeah. And all I got to do is get this first down. Don't need a touchdown. It's 27 to 0. All you need is a first down. And now the Jags are probably going into halftime down 27-0. They weren't going to get the ball back. They were not no, going to get the ball back. No. And if they did, it was going to be with maybe 80 seconds left deep in their own territory. And Trevor Lawrence has already thrown four interceptions, and they've turned the ball over five times. You know, they're not going to take any more chances. They're just like, geez, let's just freaking get into the half and, and, and sort of just take a breath and see if we can make a rally next half. So instead, you run that stupid play, and and look, there's a reason why you run these plays. You know, you see something. So I get that. And so, but again, it's not touchdowns, it's first downs. All you need is three feet. And I think that was the beginning. That, that I believe, I in my heart of hearts, believe that that play had so much to do 
with that comeback and the ability for that team to go into half instead of being down 27-0 with four interceptions and five turnovers to being down 27-7 and having carved up that defense in 80 seconds to get that score. 110%. And first off, that should have been DeAndre Carter instead of Michael Bandy. Second off, Popper had this in his article. That play has gone for negative 21 yards. Yeah, it's never here. worked. It's never it's worked. worked. It never worked with DeAndre, so it certainly didn't work with Bandy. Yeah. It's like, why and, are you calling it? And, and, you know, you're right. If they do get the ball back, maybe they get a field goal. Maybe it's 27-3 to 3 instead of 27-7. to 7. But that was the beginning of the end, and it, it, it really took a perfect storm of things happening for – the Jags win this game. It took every second. Uh, we could point to a, a, a number of plays in the second half, but you're right, Bunny. That that third and one, if you convert that, we're probably talking about going to Kansas City right now instead of talking about, oh, my gosh, the fifth biggest blown lead in NFL history. Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't know for sure because, again, the, the offense was just hot knife through butter in that second half. And a big part of that was the inability of the offense to get anything going in the second half. Now, the one thing I will say... Running the football. Couldn't run the football. When you're up 27-0, you have to sustain drives. And they couldn't. I think they had two three and outs. I think they had two series with one first down. And then they had the two field goal drives. One that they converted, one that they missed. And for people that are taking shots at at Dicker for missing the 40-yarder, I would just say this, Uh, and look, everybody knows how much I like Dicker and how much I believe in him as a kicker, Um, and and I think he very well could end up being the Chargers kicker moving forward. Well, my thing is, they would have scored the touchdown. You know, they they wouldn't remember they they had a minute left. They just they just sat on the ball and just ran the clock out. You know, they were at the fifteen. They they were not being stopped. The defense was not stopping this offense the entire second half. So. Even if they kick the field goal and they're up four, in my heart of hearts, I believe they score the touchdown and win the game that way. So that's that negates that talking point. Like, man, special teams in the most critical moments when you needed to have that field goal. Now, would it help? Sure. Gives you like, hey, you got another scoring drive. But a team that scored 27 points in the first half ought to be able to get a touchdown in the second half. Dick got three field goals to too, and he, and he hit a yeah. fifty yarder in the exactly. Third quarter. Of course, you got to make a forty yard kick. I, I get that, but you know, I, I give him the benefit of the doubt because he's won so many games with this team back half of the year and, and has been yeah. really lights out. I, I look at more of a, and and this is the reason I, that I think we're we're talking about a new offensive coordinator is the the inability to run the football in the second half of this game, because if you don't sustain drives when you're up twenty seven to nothing. You could lose. You, you're, you're playing with fire. And, you know, the, yeah, and I, go ahead. I'll say this, Chris. I think I think there's something important, though, is for people that are like, oh, we got to run the football, got to run the football. Well, it's not like it's – this is where the OC comes – the play caller comes in. Look, the, the Jags were selling out to stop the run on first down the entire game. I mean, selling out. There are six, seven guys in the box, and there's cushion on the outsides. You know, there's seven, eight yards of cushion on those outside receivers. So, what you know, the the coaches are sitting two booths away from where 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 we are sitting. The play caller is. They have the same angle we do. They're not on the sideline. They see, you know, the all twenty two angle where they can see how all the, the how the chessboard is laid out. And we just could not figure out why why are the calls coming in that are these designed runs that we can see where they're going? They're going into these heavy fronts and they're not getting anywhere. And on top of that, they were running them left. Foster Sorrell is out there after Jamari Sawyer got injured. Yeah. Run them right. Run them to Trey and Zion. Like if you're going to do it, why is it going that way? There were just so many confounding play calls in that second half. And you can run the ball better on second and four when you've picked up six on first down because you're just chucking it out to to Keenan or to Josh where they're or to Gerald Everett because they're getting five, six yards of, of cushion. So I think that was another big issue just in, in discussing, well, they couldn't run the ball effectively. A lot of that was the plays that they called to run. Yeah. Bill Bardwell had a piece talking about the play clock. I, I I'd love to get your thoughts on that, you know, when you have a big lead and you're snapping the 
the the ball with seven seconds, ten seconds, twelve seconds, seven seconds, eight seconds left on the play clock. Like I said, every second valuable in that second half. And I, I just I wonder if there is a reason behind that or if if that's even a discussion to say, okay, you know what, let's let's milk the clock as much as we can in the second half because we have such a big lead. Yeah. That, that was something that I, I, I didn't quite understand as well, especially the way Barwell laid it out. You're like, oh, wow, there was a lot of time on the clock uh, before they snapped it. Yeah, so I think for me there's – look, I, I think you do that the entire second half and it sends a terrible message to your team. It's we can't score points, yeah. our defense can't hold – so this is our way to win. So that you can't do it the entire second half. That's something to discuss on like a final drive, right? Yeah. Um, the other part of that is when you milk it all the way down, well, now the defense can time up their, their get off. And they were getting into that backfield in a hurry. They were batting a lot of balls. They were getting all the push. They had the advantage. So that's why you want to do it with the sevens and the nines and the fives as opposed to the ones and the twos or the zeros yeah. every time okay. because that way the defense is just firing. So I think that's, just to, to address that, yeah, you can't do that from the start because, man, it just sends a bad message to your team. I mean, the, you already said it, Chris. The truth is they had to run the four-minute drill, and they couldn't do it. You know, the offense just simply could not do it. Um, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of – I think there were a lot of issues – you know, it wasn't just not being able to run the ball. I don't think Justin had one of his better games. You know, you asked me, the, you know, the week of the game, what do you expect from Justin? I said, greatness. I think we got goodness. I don't think we got greatness from Justin. He had yeah. something weird going on in that game. And I think that's a big reason why you're seeing a change at the quarterback coach position too. Because a lot of people are like, wow, Shane and Herbert were really close. That's surprising. But I think we saw it too often this year. Just a weird breakdown in mechanics from Herbert in games for someone who's as tall as he is to have so many passes batted at the line of scrimmage and to have so many balls thrown that you know appear to be thrown by someone who's more six foot than six six there's you know a few that I can think of in that game obviously there's the four passes that were batted but the one that that bounced off the helmet of the defender that would have been a sure a walk-in touchdown for Keenan when there was no pressure in his face. It's like, why are you dropping your arm angle there? And now look, he had this sweet sidearm throw at the start of that game. Uh, I think yeah. it was it was beautiful. But when there's no pressure in the pocket and you've got guys that are six foot three and six foot four that are putting their hands up, get that arm up there. You know, just and that could have just been a soft toss to Keenan for the touchdown. You didn't need to fire that thing in there. So that was I, I and that happened repeatedly throughout the game. You know, the airmail throw to Keenan, who was wide open in the end zone. That's a four point. You know, that's eight points right there. Those two throws bounce off the helmet, airmail Keenan on a beautifully designed play by Joe Lombardi, the offensive coordinator that got fired. You know, that's a perfectly designed play. That should go for a touchdown. And it was just weird. You know, Herbert just kind of airmailed that thing by 10 feet over his head. Um, which we're not used to seeing. So I think... A screen you know, to Austin, too, wouldn't it? It's exactly. Uh, there was no air under it. It was yeah. really strange. And there wasn't, you know, yeah, there's pressure, but it's set up to give pressure. You know, the offensive line is releasing the defenders, and you just kind of drop that thing right over their head into his, his arms. And instead of punting on fourth, and there's, you know, speaking of plays, you know, and here, I, I just, I, I hate doing it. I'm not trying to second guess every play. We're not in the heat of the moment when they're trying to figure out what to do. But, like, that's... That's another one. I know things aren't going right, but your defense has not stopped this team. So, first of all, you complete that pass and you set up for a field goal and you kick the field goal, you know, because Eckler was going to get at least, you know, I think it was a third and 14 or something like that. He was sure. going to get at least eight, 10 yards. You know, might not have got the first down, but he would have squarely been in dicker range. You know, it would have been a less than a 50 yard field goal. So now you get a field goal out of that drive. But fourth and three from the 43. Come on, man. We know what Brandon Staley's all about. We know what this team's all about. You know, and just go for it. You know, you're net. You know, they end up netting 32 yards on that. And you do that when your defense is locking a team down, and they, as they did in the first half. If that's the first half, absolutely. Don't let these guys get up off the mat. Punt that thing. Get them deep and see if you can force another turnover, you know, because the defense is playing that well. But at that point in the game, with – the issues that they had shown, it's like, eh, I just as soon go for it, you know, and, and risk the 32 net yards, you know, as opposed to, and, and get another crack at it, as opposed to, you know, anyway. 
Yeah, I, you know, again... It, so actually, that was well, two different plays. So it was two different plays. It was the, the screen that they had to, I think, something. Anyway. We're, you know, Monday, we're six days removed from it. I know, it, exactly. It's, it's, it's still, it's still, I think, worth kind of going through. I think, man, how did this, how did this happen? You know, and, and listen, Joey, I think, had very good reason to be frustrated uh, throughout that game with, with some of the calls that were going against him. Um, but when that uh, unsportsmanlike, conduct penalty went from extra point to two point conversion that's where i thought everything kind of came into place for jackson i was like okay yeah hey, we're, we're gonna win this game with the field goal now you know and and i think that that was kind of one of those plays in the second half and again you could point to the dicker miss field goal you could point to that specific penalty you could point to the zay jones breakdown for a touchdown there was a number of plays um but that one i think is, is kind of memorable um maybe for the wrong reasons in the second half because it did give Jacksonville the opportunity to say, hey, now we can win this game with three. Yeah. And I do have to walk my thing back. I, again, it's all getting confused here. So, yeah, they punted, and it's a fourth and ten. So that's tough. You know, and it was the first possession of the second quarter. So that just goes back to yeah. what I was ta- what we were talking about. How does Justin miss Austin there? It's just it was weird, you know, yeah. where some of his passes were off. So scratch that. Um, my apologies. Um, it was a fourth and ten. I was thinking it was a fourth and three, but not. So – you said it though, you know, there's, you know, so it's, they open up, they drive the football, you know, seven plays, 37 yards to the 38. And again, you complete that screen and now you negate the end of the, the first half touchdown by three points by kicking the field goal, even if you don't get the first down um, and you're up 30 to seven and you feel pretty good. Like, Hey, we came out of the half. We got some points back. The fact that you punt that, you know, because of that missed completion, then sets the tone. They end up driving 89 yards to make it 27-14. It's now a two-score game. Two scores wins you the game, you know, with the entire third quarter practically, or the entire fourth quarter and about a third of the third quarter left. And that's, you know, when it just kind of got a little sideways on them. Yeah. So, you know, uh, let's – Let's just kind of shift forward now. Yeah, it, it's not a fun watch. It's it's a horror movie in the second half to watch. Yeah. They they found a number of things that were working. You know, there was a little more. And like to Barnwell's point about using the clock, the Chargers were certainly they adjusted. They were less aggressive. They were offering cushion, and Trevor Lawrence was deft at carving it up. Uh, I thought Kenneth Murray found himself in a lot of tough situations. They really picked on him. And um, and I think they they had kind of found a spot on the field, and that was something that was interesting that they maybe didn't go to a little bit more dime because of the way they were attacking. But I think a lot of that was okay. Let's just do this, force them to have long touchdown drives, make sound tackles, and there were players that missed tackles, that missed assignments, that didn't execute. You know, Asante bit on that double move uh, in the end zone that allowed a touchdown. You had a miscommunication by the safeties on the Zay Jones touchdown. There were assignments missed. It wasn't all just, you know, scheme and philosophy. Um, there were a lot, you said it perfectly. It was a perfect storm. There were a lot of things that went wrong in that second half to be able to say, Hey, this is why it was the dicker miss. It was the inability to run the ball. It was Kenneth Murray not being able to diagnose and figure out who he was covering. It was the, the, the lack of safety communication, it was Asante Samuel not performing. All of those things, you know, Joey Bosa's two unsportsmanlike penalties. And yes, I, I understand Joey's frustration, but you cannot do that. Yeah. Um, th- there's just, you can't. Th- th- that's 30 yards of penalties. Um, and well, 15 yards of penalties and one that ended up going from a potential tie to a potential win um, in the game. It's as frustrated as you are. And Sean Smith did not behave well. He did not acquit himself well. That is a bad look for the referee, the way he engaged Joey, who was upset with the false start and then the hold and neither of those being flagged. Um, and then the neutral zone throw is just like, wow, that's – if you're if you're three feet over the line, I got you. But holy cow, that's a rough one. Um, at the same time, it's on Joey to make sure do not give them any reason – to throw a flag so all right with that it was you know what you know what it was a devastated locker room i i've, I've never seen a locker room like that it was you could understandable hear a pin, pin drop um you saw derwin's emotions after the game you saw a lot of guys who are gracious to speak after every game they didn't even want to speak and i, I couldn't blame them a bit totally you know, get it it, it was totally it was one it. of those nights and, and money i i look at that at halftime and i'm thinking this is a this is a championship caliber defense 
This 100%. is a Super Bowl uh, caliber quarterback. Um, the, the offense didn't have to go uh, sustain long drives in the first half because of what the defense did. And then it was just the the, the perfect tale of two halves. And, and I think it, it was an example of maybe how close the Chargers are to becoming Super Bowl contenders and also – how far they have to come to to kind of clean up some of these things, be in those moments and know that, you know, you can win a playoff game and go on a run and, and beat some of the best teams in football. And, and that kind of leads us to Brandon Staley's press conference. And that was the lead this week. Um, the Chargers parted ways with, I think, three coaches uh, mm-hmm. so far, including offensive coordinator Joe Lombardi, quarterbacks coach Shane Day. Um, coach Staley said he believes there's an extra gear that this offense can go to. Um, he wants to really emphasize the marriage of the pass and the run. Um, I guess we could start with that was really the lead of, of Coach Staley's presser. Uh, your thoughts on, on what they have to do with that position now that Joe Lombardi's out? Well, I think, you know, reality is, and they won't say this, I, you know, they won't acknowledge it, but I think we know it to be true. You know, he tried to hire Kevin O'Connell. Rams, you know, denied that request. That was his first choice. Tried to hire Mike McDaniel, uh, 49ers, denied that request. And then he hired Joe Lombardi. So those first two hires tell you he wants someone from the Kyle Shanahan, you know, Mike Shanahan, which is also the Alex Gibbs school of offense, you know, wide zone and that particular style of play. Uh, Joe did not, you know, Coach Lombardi did not run that style. It's it's a, a lot of quick hitters. A lot of spread it out, a giant playbook. Um, and, you know, I, I get it. It works. But I think it's also important to remember, you know, there's a number of coordinators that were fired, you know, that, that run that system. There's head coaches that were fired that run that system. So you got to be able to marry the system with the play caller and a leader and someone that, you know, the difference between, you know, Kyle – Shanahan and, and, and Sean McVay and everybody else is they call the right plays. You know, it's, it's not just the, the philosophy and the system, but man, can they dial it up at the same time? So I say that, right? Number one, this is, it's a system that's been around forever. The Broncos won two, two Super Bowls using it. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 I mean, you know, sadly we lost Alice Gibbs last year, the guy that kind of pioneered on that offensive line and just stretching it out, stretching it out until you find that lane where you can cut back and go. And, you know, and, and, and Mike, you know, Kyle's dad made that famous. And then Kyle took it to the next level. And he's, look, there's no denying he is the best offensive play caller in the NFL. It's not even close, you know, the way he calls offense. I mean, the fact that he's done it with the quarterbacks that he's done it with, you know, an MVP campaign for Matt Ryan. If Christian McCaffrey had a full season in San Francisco, he might be the first running back MVP we've had in a long time, you know, like, and, and that's what you see. So, like, this is why I think that's where they're going to look and they're going to try their darndest to find someone from that school is you can see what it does and how it looks when you have someone like Raheem Mostert or Jeff Wilson or Elijah, you know, like when you have those players, you can get it done. But then when you plug a Christian McCaffrey in there and you see when you when you put a freaking turbo on that engine and you see what it looks like. I think that's what Brandon Staley's thinking. Like, hey, we have a Christian McCaffrey. We've got Austin Eckler. So, you know, and we've got an offensive line. We've got Corey Lindsley. We've got Rashawn Slater. And now that Trey Pipkins has established himself, and we believe that Zion's going to take that next jump. And we, now we've got Jamari Sawyer. Maybe he kicks inside. I don't know what Filer's contract is, if he has a year, if he's up, or how that works. But anyway, Sawyer, I think that's what they Sawyer see. Sawyer has earned himself some playing time somewhere, I think, on yeah. that line. Yeah. So I think, I, think that's what you, I think that's what they see. Like, we've, we've got that engine. You know, we've got Austin Eckler. And, you know, there are – look, the, you know, we know that running backs have been devalued. There's some good running backs in this draft. So I think if they can – that's kind of what I, what I see, you know. And, and we know how important physical receivers are, you know, in that, in that offense. And you see what happens – when you get a really good receiver and how it can look in Debo and, and, you know, and we know how versatile Keenan and Mike are. So now, you know, and you look, Cooper cups, a really, really, really good receiver, you know, but look what Justin Jefferson did this year when Kevin O'Connell showed up in, in Minnesota. I mean, you're talking yeah. about someone that's probably going to finish second in the MVP race or third in the MVP race. So I think that's, I think that's what they see. And that's why you're probably going to find someone from that 
school, the only other thing I could see and would make a lot of sense to me, Chris, is Frank Reich. I think having, you know, instead of having someone who's calling plays for the first time or is very young and just kind of coming up through that system, to have someone with that kind of experience um, to just take control of the offense, to take control of Justin Herbert, you know, to, to kind of really get his hands in it, someone who played the position, you know, someone that's called a balanced offense in Philadelphia when he was there with Doug Peterson and those running backs in Indianapolis when he had a bell cow like Jonathan Taylor. Like, I don't know if he's going to get a head coaching gig. Um, he should. He's a really good coach. And I think that that would be a coup to me. If you can get Frank Reich to be an OC, if he's not going to get a head coaching gig like that, that would actually be my number one if they could yeah. pull that together. He's an outstanding coach. I think he interviewed for the Cardinals job, uh, if I'm not mistaken. There were reports out there. But if we use the San Francisco example, Money, um, the one thing that Kyle's been able to do is, and we talked about this all offseason, it's not just Austin Eckler. There needs to be other running backs on this team that can effectively run the football. And, you know, the Niners, they had Elijah Mitchell, Jeff Wilson yeah. before he got traded, Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel. The list goes on and on of guys that have been able to effectively run the football in that Kyle Shanahan system in San Francisco. And, you know, we, we thought Isaiah Spiller was going to be that guy, frankly. He, he didn't get many snaps. Tony yeah. Michelle didn't work out. Uh, Joshua Kelly was hurt. But uh, in, in his limited touches, I thought he did a, he did a decent job. But, but there needs to be that one-two punch with Eckler. And it has to be, I think, an elite bell cow. Like, I don't think Austin Eckler's a bell cow. I think he's an offensive weapon that you put in all over the field. And they have to have a guy that can, you know, it's almost like what, what the Cowboys have with Zeke and Pollard, right? You need yeah. to have a hammer in Zeke on first and second down. Um, and then you unleash Pollard all over the field. Like, that that's what they're missing, I think, offensively. I'm not worried about the wide receivers. I do think they need speed. I think you need to have a speed receiver um, to complement Keenan 100%. and Mike and Joshua Palmer and maybe get a couple of them. Like, I, I think you can't ever have enough speed at the wide receiver position. Figure that out. But I'm not worried about Justin getting the ball down the field, per se. It's more that running game and honoring the run and not just with Austin. Like, like I don't know who the running backs are. We we haven't gotten there. Maybe maybe we ask DJ next week <laughs> who the top three or four running backs is, are in this draft. But like I, I maybe snag one of those guys and just say, okay, this is how we're going to run the football now. Yeah, I th I'll say uh, you know what I I'll actually disagree with you on that one, Chris. Okay. I think it's I I think it's more plays. You know, I know I said players not plays. I just think they have the player. I do think Austin can be that hammer. I think he could totally sustain a drive. We know he never goes down on first contact. I think the big concern with Austin is regular season, right? You don't want him taking those shots. But, like, in that Jacksonville game, you know, I, I completely think Austin can be that guy on that drive. Like, hey, let's feed Eckler. We know he never goes down on first contact. I know what you're saying, like you want that hammer, that big back that can get you the push. But to me, yeah. that's O-line. Like that's more, the O-line was getting shoved back off the snap on those designed runs. And so, and, and plus, you know, so much of that's Rashawn Slater, right? We remember how it looked when they ran to the left last year with Filer and Slater and Lindsley. They were getting five yards on those rushes. So to me, it's more, you know, O-line, play call, and... I, I think, you know, look, you and I have both been big Joshua Kelly fans, you know, and, and the step that he took this year in becoming a much more physical back. Now, he's a different back. He's not someone that you want, you know, stretching things out and bouncing it to the outside. He is a one gap and go, hey, you're running the A gap. Here's the ball. Go get it. And, and yeah. I think he's been he's shown that he can be effective at that. I believe in Isaiah Spiller. You know, he just get, didn't get any snaps. I mean, he was an exceptional runner. He's a big guy, you know, at A&M. Um, so I believe he can do it. Uh, for me, I think I, I think it's, it's design, it's play call, it's figuring out, you know, that, that line. You know, Rashawn's healthy. Is it Filer? Does Sawyer kick inside? You know, we know once – the one thing we figured out about Sawyer this year is once he gets his hands on you, it's over. Like, he is strong as a freaking ox. All he's yeah. got to do is get his hands on you, and you're not going anywhere. And that, to me, bodes pretty darn well for kicking him inside of, of, of um, Rashawn. And, and now you've got, you know, some pretty big bodies, you know, in, in Zion and Sawyer 
and Trey, who I think really, you know, that's that's going to be the big question on the line. You, you know, know is, I, 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 money. I, the only thing I'm thinking though is that we didn't get enough. We don't know. Like w- Joshua didn't touch the ball enough. Right. Isaiah didn't play. Like Isaiah should have played in Week 18. In my opinion, I, I would have given him 15 carries to 100%. see what we got with him. Like we, we never saw him. So like. How can we have an accurate assessment of, of who he is? You know what I mean? He could be he could be awesome like we thought he was going to be, but we didn't get to see him. Right. And I think that's why – so I think you can play that both ways, right? Like you can play it as, look, we know, you know, we believe in this guy in the first round, you know, and, and we're going to go snatch him up and put him back there. Or you say, look, look, let's go back and watch the film again of Isaiah at A&M and just see what – you know, why yeah. did we draft him and why did he – you know, why were so many people excited about that pick? So um, I, I think the, you know, I think just going back to the old line too, I think it's a question of, are they going to pay Trey or are they just going to move Jamari over there? You know, yeah. because you, 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 you keep this guy on the roster. And I think that's a tough one for Tom, right? It's like, we saw the potential he had. We drafted him out of Sioux Falls State, you know, knowing that it was going to take a couple years. And in a couple years, we've developed him into a really good right tackle. Trey played really well this year. And through um, injury. It, through injury, so you know he's tough. Um, I thought he played really well. And so it is it is hard to find offensive linemen. You want to, you want me to overpay for one position group? That's number one on my list. Well, number two, quarterback. When you have a quarterback, obviously you're going to pay. But it's right there because nobody has two tackles. Like, nobody in the league has two tackles. So the fact that you could have two and a swing on a sixth-round rookie deal, I mean, that's, on a, you know, like, that's that's where you can really do some damage now, um, yeah. you know, up front, knowing that you have that advantage over other teams. So it'll be interesting. But I think I just did not like the designed runs this year, Chris. Like, for me, that was the big deal. I did not like the play calling when it came to which direction they were. And they did, you know, and – and they did it last year, too. How many times were we coming out of games going, why are they running the ball right? You know, why are you running to the right side of the line? When, when you run behind Slater and Filer, you're getting all these yards. It was just very curious. And I think a lot of that went into the, the reason why there is going to be a change. And, and look, when, remember now, when there's a change at OC, you're probably going to have a change in blocking schemes. And that's something you're going to have to figure out, you okay. know. So that, that may be where they end up having to invest draft capital as, hey, we need a little bit more nimble, you know, offensive linemen because we're going to be running, you know, this wide zone and, and we're going to have to have these guys can really get after it and, and move. So depending on who they, they hire on that side of the ball, you know, is, is kind of what, what they're going to have to figure out. I mean, the good thing is there's so much wide receiver talent in college now, so much wide receiver talent yeah, that you can find – Look at Jennings in San Francisco. What was he, a sixth-round pick? I mean, he is lighting it up, you know, and I think that's something that can, like you said, I, I, would, I would love to see them invest, you know, in some, some speed receivers out there as, as well to try to get this thing back to what we were seeing when, you know, Justin was a rookie, and even though T. Billy is, you know, barely playing at all, Jay, you know, Guyton was essentially, you know, an undrafted free agent signing. You saw what it could look like when you get guys that got four three speed out there and get down the field. Herbert can get it to him. Yeah, that that was like you know, Guyton got hurt at the end of that week three game. There was so much that happened in that game against Jacksonville that it was almost kind of like a, a secondary thought, and it ended up being a huge deal for this offense because you can't really respect a, a deep threat when you don't have one. You know, other than Mike. You know, and then Mike yeah. and Keenan not on the field at the same time. Um, the offensive line, though. You know, for as much incoming as Joe Lombardi took this year, I, I just want to say this. Justin Herbert uh, was the all-time Chargers single-season passing leader last year. Um, they had some good moments offensively, and there was no Rashawn Slater this year at left tackle. I, I, I can't, I think, emphasize enough what a big deal that was for this team. Now, I think whoever comes in, you're going to have Slater back 100%. You're going to have an all-pro center in Corey Lindsley. You're going to have a guy in Zion that uh, I thought had a, had a decent rookie year and yeah. is only going to get better. Um, and then you mentioned Pipkins and, and Sawyer. Uh, Tom said that uh, he was so proud of the way Pipkins played this year, playing through pain, and that he said Sawyer saved him. You know? and, and Filer, I think you know, we'll probably know more with his cap number and what they plan to do with him. But they have guys in place. And like you said, if you, if you change the offensive line scheme, 
it, you can find guys in the second, third round in this draft that, that can come in and make an immediate impact and give you more depth across the offensive line, especially if you, mar- if, if you, if you marry a, a run scheme that works and you have the running backs in addition to Austin that work, and hopefully that is Kelly and Spiller, um, you, you could be in good shape. Uh, you, just, you have to have an offense that uh, when the defense is game planning, they're not just looking at number 10. They're looking at, okay, we, we have to stop this run game too in addition to Justin Herbert's arm. Yeah, I think, you know, I think the one thing we're doing too, though, Chris, is, and I, look, it's a product of, you know, who was let go and the fact that they're, they're hiring new coaches and, you know, it's Justin Herbert. You know, we also have to remember, they got to fix some things on the defense, you know? Oh, um, yeah, we'll get to defense, of course. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think it's, you only have so much draft capital. You only have so many free agent dollars. You know, you got your own free agents. Justin, I'm guessing, is probably going to get his deal this offseason it seems like elite quarterbacks you know you don't have to wait till the fourth year you get it after year three so you can use that fourth year to help lower the cap number on the overall length of the deal there's a reason why they do it once you know you have the guy it benefits you to do the deal earlier so you can lower the cap number with that fourth year uh salary on the rookie contract it it helps incredibly so that's so you're going to have that deal this offseason that's going to impact the cap and, and shoot it up a little bit um, as well. So, yeah, I think we – I think and, – and look, I'll say uh, – just to kind of wrap the offense for, for me, I'll say this. I think, um, I think the quarterback coach is as important it, – well, it's not as important, but it's pretty close. Yeah. I think you got to get someone in there that's going to challenge Justin, that's going to really – you know, I, I – I can't speak specifically to it, but just kind of seeing the way they interacted, man, he and he and Shane Day were very chummy. They were very friendly. Um, and I would love to see someone for all the talent that Justin has, you know, in that, in that body of his. I would love to see someone really get in there and make sure that, that he is able to maximize. Every, he, he has the ability. He has the brain to potentially be the greatest that has ever played this game. He has got everything. It is all there. And and I would love to see someone in those roles, two people in those roles, quarterback, coach, offensive coordinator, that are able to unlock that. Um, We see what our old friend Shane Steichen's been able to do with, with, you know, Jalen Hurts. Yeah, pretty good. And and, and how that's gone, you know, and what he was able to do with Justin when he was here in Justin's rookie year. So, you know, it's so important to get that role right. And, And, you know, I'm sure that Tom and, and Brandon are going to be able to do that because who the heck would not want this job? You want to talk about a, a, a plum gig to get yourself a head coaching job. So many of these offensive coordinators are being hired to be head coaches. And, you know, that's – I would imagine guys are going to be lining up to take this gig. Let's go defensively. Uh, that first half was awesome. You know, Asante Samuel Jr. was incredible. Uh, three interceptions yeah. and a half. Um, the way that they played down the stretch uh, – minus week 18 uh, was probably the reason why they, they were playing in, in January in Jackson. 100%. Uh, same time, uh, run defense was still an issue. Um, I think there is some depth at some certain positions where it was tested this year. They, they were able to get, uh, get over the hump, um, but they have to be a more consistent team. They talked about perimeter defense. They talked about run defense in, in the presser, both in, in Tom's and uh, in Staley's presser. What do you see with the defense and what needs to change here in 2023, Mike? Well, I think the snap count for Nas tells you that that probably is going to change. You know, yeah. I think that they were repeatedly concerned about his tackling. Um, you know, we knew he was a playmaker coming out of Delaware and it just never quite came to fruition. And then when you factor in some of the issues with the run, you know, with the run defense with Nas, I think that's probably something they'll be looking at. Uh, I thought Aloe played great in, you know, when, when called he up, really did. Uh, yeah, I think he's a valuable piece. Um, you know, Mikey thankfully is under contract still. So, you know, he'll be back. You'll end up getting JC Jackson back. And I think what'll be interesting is, right, Michael Davis was the odd man out, you know, as the fourth corner. I don't think any more. (laughs) So, and I think a big part of that is, and, and, you know, I know this is going to sound crazy, but I think, you know, Asante is great at what he does. And you saw that, three interceptions. But there are some tackling issues. And I think that's what Coach was talking about, perimeter defense and tackling. 
and you know you think about that fourth and one play that can end the game and you think about last year in week 18 you tackle Josh Jacobs and that can end the game they're not going to attempt a 54 yard field goal you know with the Chargers having 50 seconds on the clock and a timeout they're just going to take a knee and both teams are going to the playoffs instead you know Josh takes Asante for a 12 yard ride you know and in this one on a fourth and one it seemed as though just by the way it was lined up, it looked like they thought that could be a possibility because they had Asante kicked wide of that box as the guy that was supposed to be there as, as you know, setting that edge and making sure. Um, and he wasn't able to do it. You know, he broke in for whatever reason on the snap, even though there's no way he's going to be able to do anything on a quarterback sneak. Like, there's nothing you can do. You've got you've to set that edge. Yeah. So I think that's what he was alluding to. Um, so I think that's going to be interesting. The defensive back group, you know, we know they have the best safety in the league in Derwin James. Um, we know how great Michael Davis played this year. He's under contract for another year. We know they believe in J.C. Jackson. Um, he'll be back healthy. Yeah, well, when, when will he be back, though? I think that's the big thing, right? Fair question. Yeah, fair question. You know, and um, so I think that's I think kind of that's and, and look, we already saw it, right? We saw, you know, where Jasir Taylor was playing snaps instead of you know, instead of Asante in certain games, you know, and I think that sends that signal of, yeah, he's a really good player, you know, in certain situations, but in others, we have concerns. Um, I think they got to figure out what they're doing with Kenneth. I thought he played better this year, obviously, than he had the previous two seasons. However, that second half of the Jags game, and there's some other games out there that, that, I, that leave me with some serious concerns. And I think that's a big reason why Michael Wilhoit was released, was let go as linebackers coach and they're looking for a new one. I think they're trying to figure that out as well, you know. Um, so I, Tranquil's, you know, he's a free agent and he's really good. He's a yeah. really, really good player. I hope we, I, I really hope we see him back. Um, Money, sorry to interrupt. You hear, you hear so much about how maybe linebackers aren't as valuable in this system, but mm -hmm. uh, you look at what Kaiser did last year and what he's doing in Philadelphia right now. You look at what Drew did taking over the play calling, really becoming a leader and having his best year by far in, in 2022, um, really establishing himself. Do you think that Drew should be a priority uh, in terms of uh, free agents that they need to keep defensively? 100%. Yeah. I, think, I think in some cases, linebacker stats um, can be misleading. Uh, I think there are certain linebackers out there that you'll see lead the league in tackles. Um, pile up huge tackle statistics and you just kind of know like yeah I mean I they're they're funneling the way the defense is designed is they are funneling you know players to him and he all you know he's there to make that stop and look they have to make the stop I'm not trying to take too much away but I think when those guys I, and look I think Kaiser to some degree was one of those guys you know where you pile up a lot of tackle stats that's not Drew Drew is so good at run fills and fits it run fits he's he's so good at timing up the blitz um he has ball skills you know where he's able to secure interceptions uh he's athletic he can move side i mean he's converted safety you know the guy it, you know that now has the size and the strength to play linebacker so to me yes drew is a pivotal piece because i think this team could play more dime because of derwin you know, you can be because of the way that Derwin can play, you know, and if I think if you had another safety that you trusted and clearly they for whatever reason they stopped trusting Nas later in the season, you know, Derwin can play that dime linebacker role, you know, that money, that star, that, that easily. So I think Drew is is so important. Um you know, Kenneth look, Kenneth had a half sack in that game against the Jags, but in the second half, they really got him. They 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 really got after him. And I think in coverage you know, that's where the issues start to show up with Kenneth Murray is is decision making and diagnosing and being able to do it in the moment and, and kind of knowing where that ball is going to go. And I, I just feel like too many times we see him flat footed, not quite sure which way he's supposed to play it. And and man, it gets away from you in a hurry. So I think on that level of the football, on that level of the defense, Drew, 100 percent for sure. Um and, and I think they got to figure out what they want to do. Because, look, he's got one more year on his rookie deal. So, you know, you're probably not going to cut a guy like that loose. It's just – and I think that's why you saw that, you know, the, the, the change in the linebacker coaches. They're like, all right, let's try to find someone because we know the guy's got freaking 
athletic ability for days. My gosh, we see him walking around. And it's like, holy cow, you know, and you know how fast he can run. It's there. So I think they just want to get that coaching hire right at the linebacker level and try to get Kenneth Murray, you know, to, to play up to his potential considering the physical gifts that he has. So we talk about cap savings and all that stuff, and that, that'll be something that plays itself out here over the next couple of months. Uh, Khalil Mack. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see Joey and Khalil on the field for as, as much as we, we needed to see. Um, yeah. Khalil has a big cap savings number um, this upcoming year. Uh, I, I thought, you know, he did his job. You know, he he uh, commanded a bunch of double teams. He, he started the year with a bang with three sacks against the Raiders. Um, was in a tough position not having Joey on the other side. Um, how do you move forward at the edge position around Joey? Um it's 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 an interesting dilemma, I, I think, because you know Kyle Van Noy played great down the stretch. He's a little bit older. Um, Chris Rumpf still developing, um, and then you got Khalil w- with this uh, big cap number in twenty twenty three. I think they keep him. Uh, it's a lot of money to sink into the edge position, but it's it's you know the third, it's the second or the third most important position on the field. You know, yeah. O line, quarterback, then O line, then D line. You know, especially pressure, edge rushers. Um, so, I think they keep them. Um, if you had, you know, if you had some other edge rushers that developed that you can then plug in there, you know, then you're fine. You know, this is where re-signing Chenna would have come in handy. You know, because his number was not that big. I think he got like ten or twelve million from the Seahawks. Just sign him. Keep that guy, man. And and I think great this year. Yeah, he played great this year, but I get it. You know, you want to go out and get Khalil, and the idea of pairing Khalil with Joey was certainly enticing. Totally get that. Um, but unfortunately, the guy they had to replace, you know, <laughs> Khalil what, is now in Seattle. So that's that's where it, it becomes very tough to let him go because we saw what it looked like with no one opposite him. There was no pass rush, you know. It, and, now, and then it came alive. It came alive in those final four weeks with Van Noy really settling in. I think they bring him back. I think Kyle would want to stay. I could see them bringing him back. Such a valuable piece, you know, played so well down the stretch. Man, he almost locked that thing up with that tip at the line of scrimmage and nearly yeah. hauled it in on that final drive. And, boy, that would have changed things in a hurry. He's just such a good player. I'd really like to see him back. I'd like to see Morgan Fox back. Um, you know, remember the interior of that line, they're going to get Austin Johnson back. We know how good he was. They're going to get Tito Abonia back. So that D-line could really be a strength if you just bring everyone back. Now, that's easy to say because they're all going to want races and they're all making a pretty good amount and you need some rookies on those deals and there aren't any. You know, there's Tito and there's Rumpf. Um, otherwise, it's it's Morgan Fox who's going to probably get some offers. He played, you know, career high in sacks from the interior. That's valuable around the league. So you have to figure that out. You know, Kyle, I think, is always going to have value around the league, but it certainly feels like he really likes it here. Um, and I know that Kyle wants to get into broadcasting you know, after he's done playing. And so I think that staying here is pretty good, a pretty good option. That's what I mean. So that could help you get a little bit of a discount, you know, for Kyle. And, and I would love to see that if he's willing to do it. Um, So yeah, I would, I I would think they would just bring it back, you know, run it back is, is what I would think on, on that. And then also invest, invest in the draft, you know, and, and Tito, I thought, was a great, you know, it was, a, it was a real hit and miss draft this year for, you know, for the Chargers. They traded their second. They got Khalil Mack. Hit. Zion, first round, I thought, absolute hit. Um, JT Woods, obviously, barely active. You know, Isaiah Spiller, barely active. Special teams, Dean, Jasir, fantastic. So important to their special teams play this year. We obviously know Jamari Sawyer, uh, a home run. And I think Tito was on the way to being a home run. Yeah, on the Tito's interior of that line. Time. Yeah. So, you know, do it again. Do that again. Tom and Brandon team up in the draft and, and do that again, you know, and, and get, you know, and, and get after it. We, it's funny, you know, for all the people that, that kind of take shots at Tom, man, when you look at some of these teams and the way their draft picks, li- their first round picks line up, to see the Chargers and their first round picks and how – he hits over and over, you know, Mike Williams, Derwin James, Joey Bosa, Zion, Rashawn Slater. Like, it's just hit after hit. And Justin Herbert, obviously. You know, so so important to hit on your first rounder. Um, 
And he has repeatedly. You know, Jerry Tillery is the one miss, you know, and, and that was the 28th pick. So, yeah. yeah. You know, it gets a little tougher when you're back there, but and you hope um, that Kenneth, and you hope that Kenneth can can maintain or improve upon. You know, I thought it was improve. A, I thought it was a win though for for Kenneth to play as much as he did this year and, and yeah. kind of get get back to. You know, he he had a lot of injuries in addition to a new coaching staff last year, and there was just a lot of things swirling there. And, and I I I was, you know, just watching him, and he's such a good guy. You, you're proud of a guy 100%. like that to come back and bounce back. You know. 100%. And I think, look, I think for, again, I think that's why there's going to be a new linebackers coach. Because they feel like, yeah, he took another step this year. So now let's get someone else in there and see if we can really unlock it. Because again, there's there's flashes. It's there. It's just the big issue is getting someone that can coach him to be more comfortable in those moments where he's got to make a decision, where he's got to pick A or B or A, B or C. And that's just the next step for him. And I, Look, I believe he can take it. I, I think, you know. So, I, I to me, that's that's kind of where it all comes into play. So the so the draft this year, money obviously bring in a, a you know the, these are going to be guys that are going to really change the way the twenty twenty three roster looks. But I also w- would put J T Woods and Isaiah Spiller in that category as guys that we don't really know much no. about at this yeah. point. And and you hope that they can develop because everybody. Everybody develops differently. Sometimes it just fizzles out, but sometimes the light goes on and an opportunity comes on, and and you can, you can see what JT Woods is. I know he had a, I, I just I remember that that Arizona game, a tough moment for him with the the DeAndre Hopkins touchdown, and we didn't really see much of him uh, throughout this year, you know. And again, we talk, we already talked about Isaiah. Uh, we saw the talent in training camp and in the film at Texas A and M. You know, these are two guys that are currently on this roster that you hope can make an impact, especially with a little bit of flux at the other safety position opposite Derwin. I think in the terms of, you know, for JT, you know, that you, you can't, you, you have to have a good decision maker back there. That position yeah. has got to be able to make the right decision every time because you're the last line of defense. And I think far too often they were concerned with that. Um, and look, it's a lot, man. It's a lot that the game is so much faster in the NFL than college. Um, and so I, it's a lot to take in. Um, I'm hopeful that, that he can figure it out because look, the guy led the nation in interceptions, you know, his senior year at Baylor. So we know he can, he can catch football and he can make plays. It's just a matter of getting it, getting the game to slow down so he can get that decision-making part of it. Right. Not a great tackler. He's probably got to, you know, and, and, and that's, that's the other issue. You got to be able to tackle, you know, so, you know, so many teams are all about that. You know, the Jags are one of them. They are, you better, you better, you know, diagnose correctly, make that tackle because they are a physical team. You know, the, the, the size of those receivers, the strength, you know, Etienne is a load. Uh, not only is he fat, he's 220 pounds, 215, 220 pounds, 6'1". So, like, it's things like that that, you know, I, I think come into play for JT. Diagnosing, being able to tackle. Um, you know, we talked about the offense and, and the need for a speed receiver. We know how deep it is. There's speed all over the first round at that position, um, you know, that they could look at. I think the other thing, you know, that you got to ask yourself is, you know, since Hunter left, you know, it, I think I think if you would ask Tom, hey, I, I get it. The injuries were a concern. The number that the Patriots threw in front of them was crazy. Yeah. But knowing what you know now, I think they would have liked to have just given that same deal to Hunter, you know, just to have that that all around tight end, you know, that Hunter Henry is. Um, so I could see them addressing that as well, because man, it, when we got to the red zone and look, Everett was great, you know, tied a career high in touchdowns, career high in catches, career high in yards. Um, at the same time, you know, he's pass catching tight. He's not really that full service tight yeah. end. Um, and I think it's hard to have, you know, I, I do think the tight end room probably needs to be addressed. Um, and sir, if, if there is someone, if there's someone in a spot where you're comfortable and, and look, I'm biased. I called the game where he absolutely lit up SC, but man, Dalton Kincaid is special at Utah. I know he's got some injury issues, but that dude is, I mean, I'm, it's crazy to say that guy's like Travis Kelsey esque, like he is different. Um, so I think getting an elite tight end could, you know, along with, 
people keep talking about that speed receiver, but to me, like elite tight end, man, that could really unlock some things for this offense as well. I agree with you. It's been a, a bit of a revolving door, right? Since yeah. Hunter, like you had Jared Cook, and then you know the, the potential of Parham is there, but you know he missed a lot of this season. Yeah. Gerald had some really good games. He had some drops, but he also had, you know, he had a 100-yard game in the playoffs. You know, I, I thought Gerald exactly. uh, played well, but that you, the, the type of tight end you're talking about is, is I think, the guy that, that they lack right now. And he could be maybe the missing piece to this offense as well. So yeah. that's a, that'll be another fun position to look at. The last thing, I, I can't believe we went an hour. Uh, the I last thing I have, uh, Money, is just, you know, Rick Goslin does these special teams rankings every year, and the Chargers – uh, we're seventh, and that never happens. So Ryan Flicken deserves a ton of credit for what he did in just one season with this team. And I, I really thought that the way the special teams played kept them in games, won them games, and, and really was the, the most steady presence in all three phases this year by far. I, look, I, I think there's so much, you know, look, start with Ficken, right? He's the one that coached him up. Number yep. two, you know, is a tie, Brandon Staley and Tom Telesco. You know, working that draft, working free agency. Remember, they they signed, you know, they spent the most money that any team has spent on a long snapper in Josh Harris, right? So they bring in the right long snapper. And then, you know, Dustin Hopkins goes down and Bertolette comes and he's perfect in his game. Then Bertolette goes down, Hopkins comes back, boots a bunch of field goals with a busted up quad and he goes down and then they go out and get Cameron Dicker, who was exceptional all season long. They identified the punter. I'm sure I, I'm, I would have to believe that Ficken's the one that told them uh, about J.K. Scott yeah, you know, having played North. in this division in the, in the North. And so, you know, Scott, who had a rough season the season prior, he's like, no, this is the guy. And, yeah, he was the guy. And on top of that, you go out and you spend money on DeAndre Carter, who was, I think, what, third in punt return average yards? It, basically, you know, the way Tom said it to us is, hey, every time he gets a – how good is DeAndre Carter? Every time he returns a punt, he gets you a first down. 11 yards. Yeah. Average punt return. He gets you a first down on every punt return. So, you know, you credit coach and and um, and general manager Tom Telesco and obviously Ryan Fick and the special teams coach. And look, they signed Troy Reader into the back end of that draft. We know how much Brandon Staley loves having defensive backs on special teams, and they invested heavily in Jasir Taylor, Dean Leonard. They won them a game together, those two rookies, the Broncos game in overtime, forcing that fumble and the game-winning field goal there. Um, they got the fifth turnover, turnover of the game in Jacksonville. You exactly. Know? You know, so it's, it's, um, it's a test, and that's an important position. It, it, it's an important facet. You know, they always talk about three phases. To have that third phase – when games are as tight as they are in the NFL these days, you know, and there's a reason why underdogs ruled this year, you know, and parity is always good. We had another, what was it, 19? I think it's 19 years in a row. No, I think it's every year. I want to say it has been every single year since 19, whatever, 94, that a team has gone worse to first, you know, in, in at least one division. It's crazy. Like, it just speaks to the parity and how tight games are. And why special teams is so important. So to have that right moving forward now, um, and they have an interesting decision to make at kicker. You know, I was going to ask you, what is it? Hopkins? Or you keep uh, Dicker? Like I, 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 I hate doing it because you know it's somebody's livelihood. You know, yeah. but you know the typically the youth always wins out just because of the cost. You know, when you're trying to scrap and save every cent, you know, you want to pay Cameron Dicker. 750 grand you want to pay Dustin Hopkins 4 million bucks you know it's just it's just economics at that point if you if you feel as though the difference between those two is negligible and you could probably make a case that Dicker you know even outperformed Dustin um just because of the kickoffs and I think it's so important to remember that how in how booting that ball out of the back of the end zone benefits a team from having to make tackles um, you know, the physical toll that it takes on having to having to tackle a returner um, and how good some returners are in this league. You know, Agnew is such a good returner. And even with those conditions out there, Dicker was, you know, I think there were one or two maybe that he returned. Otherwise, he was able to boot them all out of the back of the end zone. So I'd be very surprised if Cam Dicker wasn't back next year as their kicker. You talk about touchbacks. This isn't the sexiest of stats, but punt coverage, 3.1 yards for the Chargers, best in the NFL. The worst was Cleveland, 12.3. The league average, 8.88. I mean, that 
that's unbelievable. Yeah. It, compared to what we've seen from the special teams of the Chargers, really, you know, I, I can just date it back to when they moved to LA in 2017. What they did this year was nothing short of exceptional. So, so kudos yeah. to Ryan Ficken. I think um, I'm just pulling up the numbers here to 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 show you the difference, and um, I think you know. Here we go, punting, and I want to go. You mentioned the return yards, so led the league in return yards. Um, at where is it? Hold on, average. There it is. So uh, three point one, right? Let's go to the 2021 regular season, and the Chargers are 29th, 11. Uh, fair catches five in 2021 five fair catches uh, which means you have to cover all of those punts yeah. right 73 punts five or, or this year 33 that is a plus 28 in fair catches <laughs> you know now there were 73 punts this year I go back to last year I want to make sure I'm not kind of so it's a lot different, right? Last year, uh, you got a lot more punts this year, 73 to 47, but still five and 11 on average, which is third worst in the league compared to 3.9 and and uh, and that many and 32. So 33. I mean, just, yes, they got that one. They got that one right with JK. No doubt about it. They nailed it. They nailed it. All right. Hey, we're going to have a lot of time this offseason to, to break down position groups, the draft, free agency, Anything else before we get out of here? Just a huge thanks, you know, to all the people that downloaded, uh, that interacted with us through social media. You know, we're lucky to get to do this. Love doing it every week with you, Chris. Big thank you to you, to our man, BG, uh, for helping us set it up all week. And uh, obviously the the whole social media team and the digital team led by uh, Jason. Um, Just awesome. It's, It's really great to work with this team. They're so talented in digital media. Um, in social media and and what they allow us to do and putting this together and putting it up for the people that consume it and for those of you that do consume it we can't thank you enough it's a lot of fun to do this every week yep i echo all that man i I love doing this with you brother as always and uh, we'll keep it rolling all off season so for money i'm chris this has been chargers weekly the first one of 2023's offseason